We've all used what you see is what you get applications where we manipulate the objects in the document directly. Graphics editors, presentation software, and word processors all allow the user to directly manipulate the objects the user wants to change. For most people, this direct manipulation is the normal, expected way that computers operate. Want to change something? Click on it, drag it, change it. Direct manipulation is intuitive and powerful. In some cases, however, direct manipulation can be overly repetitive. Copy-paste often helps, but cannot always capture the actual relationships between the objects. Creating a design like this can clearly become tedious. Moreover, modifying it might be just as hard as creating it in the first place. For example, if the user wants to change the design of the branches on this tree, they will likely have to edit each branch individually or start over from scratch. As programmers, we might instead write a program to generate our graphic using our favorite general purpose language. But there are trade-offs. We lose the fluid workflow of direct manipulation. You know how it goes. You run the code and it doesn't work quite right, so you go back and you tweak a number in the code and you run the program again. Uh, it's still not quite right, so you change the number and run it again and... Uh. Is there a better way? Instead, wouldn't it be great if, when you see that the output of your program isn't quite what you want, you could directly manipulate the output, and then the system updates your program in real time to synchronize it with your changes? This ideal workflow, which we call live synchronization, is what we present to you today. Live synchronization is a particular kind of program synthesis problem. Since we want to facilitate an interactive workflow, there are a few principles that have guided our solution. First, we need the synthesis to be fast, so that program updates occur in real time. Second, the kind of updates we synthesize should be intuitive, so that the program is still understandable. Finally, the updates should be automatic, so that we don't have to stop and ask the user questions. In the rest of this talk, we'll explain how we implemented a live synchronization system that meets these goals. Let's start by looking at a simple example. Say we want a program that uses a loop to draw identical, evenly spaced boxes. Our design has several parameters. There's the x and y position of the first box, the width and height for each of the boxes, the amount of separation between the boxes, and finally the number of boxes. We draw the boxes by mapping the numbers 0, 1, and 2 to a function that, when given an index i, will draw the ith box. Each box that it draws has the same color, y position, width, and height. The x position is calculated from the index by adding the initial x position x0 to i times the separation. As expected, when this program is run, it produces three evenly spaced boxes. Now, suppose the user drags the third box from its initial x position of 110 over to a new x position of 155. We need to update the program to match. In particular, we need to synthesize a new program such that this expression for xi evaluates to 155 when the index is 2. What should we change? There's a lot of options for how we might change the program, and each of them is going to have a different effect on the other boxes. We might introduce a branch saying that if the index is 2, use 155, otherwise use the old equation. This has the effect of moving only the third box while leaving the other two boxes in place. Another option is to change x0, the x position of the first box. This has the effect of translating all the boxes together. Alternatively, we might instead change the separation between the boxes, which will spread the boxes apart. And in fact, we could change both x0 and sep in different amounts, and there's many ways we could change both of them. Given all of these options, what should we do? Recall that one of our goals is to provide intuitive updates, and one way to provide that is to preserve as much of the existing program as possible. Consequently, we choose not to introduce control flow. Similarly, changing both x0 and sep is not intuitive, because there's no clear way to say how much one should change versus the other. Our remaining options are to change a single number in the program, either x0 or sep. We call changes to only a single number small updates. And because they are intuitive, such small updates are the only kind of changes our live synchronization will make. 
Still, a question remains. Should we change x0 or sep? Although we could ask the user what to change, remember that one of our goals was not to interrupt the workflow. Instead, we rely on a heuristic to choose what to change automatically. In this particular case, the heuristic chooses x0 to change. Let's talk about how it makes that choice. The first thing to notice is that this choice between x0 or sep is not specific to dragging the third box. If we drag the first or second box, the system also has to choose between changing either x0 or sep. What do we do? The heuristic assigns different program locations to different shapes, trying to balance the number of times each program location is assigned to some shape on the canvas. For this example, what this means is that the assignment alternates between x0 and sep. If box 1 is dragged, x0 changes. Dragging box 2 changes sep, and box 3 is assigned to change x0. If we had more boxes, the pattern would continue. Box 4 changes sep, and box 5 changes x0. In this way, the heuristic balances the number of shapes that will change x0 and sep. So we've talked about how we constrain the program synthesis search space to small updates, and we've talked about our heuristic for choosing exactly which program location to change. But we haven't talked about how the system knows that this expression here is the relevant expression. How does the system discover that the output value for the third box's x value came from this formula? We use a lightweight form of instrumentation where output values are tagged with a trace that describes how each value was computed. For example, consider this simple program with a assigned to 3 and b assigned to 5 normal evaluation of a plus b produces the number 8. We tag each number with a trace that describes how that number was computed. So the literal 3 is tagged with the program location a. The literal 5 is tagged as coming from program location b. And when a and b are added together, the resulting value 8 is tagged with a trace, saying that it came from adding program location a to program location b. This gives us a record of the execution history that produced each number. For our boxes example, when the program is evaluated, the third box's x position of 110 has been tagged with the trace x0 plus 2 times sep. When the user drags the third box, we set up an equation to solve. The right hand side of this equation is derived from the trace. The left hand side is the desired x position of the box, which we know by taking the initial x position and adding the distance the mouse moved. Now we have an equation to solve. The heuristic assigned x0 to change when we drag this third box, so x0 becomes the hole we solve for. SEP is replaced by its value. We solve this equation, producing a new value for x0. The system immediately reruns the program with this new x0 and renders the output. In practice, we don't have to wait for the user to finish dragging. Instead, we provide real-time feedback by continuously solving and re-rendering while the user is dragging. In this way, live synchronization pro provides an intuitive, interactive workflow. We just talked about how traces are turned into equations that we give to a solver. What kinds of equations will our solver need to handle? At the end of evaluation, all numbers in the output are tagged with a trace. Each trace is either a program location x representing a program literal in the AST, or a simple operation on traces such as basic arithmetic or a built-in function such as sine, cosine, pow, mod, etc. Thus, each trace is just a simple formula that becomes one side of the equation we want to solve to change a desired number in the output. There are two things to note about our traces. One is that we don't keep track of control flow. In our earlier example, if our b variable is instead computed based on a conditional, the final trace only contains the program location b1 from the branch that was taken. While this approach throws away control flow information, it still works out well in practice. We wrote many examples and found that, for creating graphics at least, the programs don't branch too often. Even when they do, it's rare for a branch to cause a trace to change during live synchronization. Certainly, a trace language that records control flow may be useful in some cases and is one avenue for future work.
The second point to note about our traces is that they are fairly simple. Whatever solver we use just needs to do high school math. We implemented a simple solver that can solve equations like these, where the variable being solved for only occurs once in the expression. If x occurs multiple times in the equation, such as these variations, the solver fails to compute a solution. Although this limits expressiveness, in practice this solver is good enough for 80% of the equations in our examples. We will incorporate a more full-featured solver in the future. Now that we've seen all these parts of our solution, let's recap how all these pieces fit together. We start by writing a program. When the program is evaluated, each number in the output comes tagged with a trace of the expression that produced the number. Before any direct manipulation from the user, we process each shape in the output one at a time and rely on our heuristics to assign what program location will change if the shape is manipulated. In our boxes example, we set the first box to change x0, the second box will change sep, and the third box will change x0. Now we're ready for live synchronization. When the user drags the third box, we form a trace equation, which we solve for x0. We use this value to make a small update to x0 in the program. Immediately, we rerun the program and render the new output. Since we solve update and re-render continuously as the user drags the mouse, the user sees the boxes follow their mouse movements in real time. This is live synchronization. We implemented live synchronization in a web-based tool called Sketch and Sketch, consisting of about 6,000 lines of Elm code. Let's take a look at some examples. Here's our three boxes. Sure enough, if we drag the third box, all boxes translate together as x0 changes. If we drag the second box, the separation changes. And if we drag the first, x0 changes. If we hover over a box, a caption at the bottom tells us what will change. Dragging this box will change y0 and x0. Similarly, we can see highlights in the code. The value of x0 and y0 are highlighted in yellow, indicating that they will change when we drag. The value of sep is highlighted in gray, meaning that it, it appeared in the output trace, but the heuristics did not select it to be modified. When we drag the box, the constants are highlighted in green as they change. We talked about how the heuristics automatically choose what will change. What if we don't like the choice? Say, for example, that we're happy with the separation and we don't want it to change anymore. We can mark any constant as frozen by adding an exclamation mark. This annotation instructs Sketch and Sketch not to change the value during direct manipulation. Now, dragging any box modifies x0. No box modifies sep. We're not limited to just changing the box's position. We can also change the box's width and height. But what about changing the number of boxes? There's nothing on the canvas that we can drag to change n. For a design parameter such as this, we allow the user to annotate the number with a range, which tells Sketch and Sketch to draw a slider that controls the number. This example is almost exactly the same, but now the y position of each box is calculated based on a sine wave. Direct manipulation lets us change the wave amplitude, in addition to the parameters that we could change in the last example. This program imitates the logo for the Chicago Botanic Garden. The design symmetry is enforced by the program. If we move a control point of the Bezier curve on one side, its mirror point moves as well. Here's our Sketch and Sketch logo. The position of the three polygons is calculated relative to a white rectangle behind the design. By grabbing this rectangle, we can move and scale the entire design similar to a traditional direct manipulation editor. Unlike a traditional editor, the spacing between the polygons is encoded with a single parameter, which we can manipulate directly to change the thickness of the lambda symbol in our logo. Here's a ferris wheel design. 
Imagine how difficult it would be to add more spokes to this wheel in a traditional editor. In Sketch and Sketch, it's easy. Other parameters of the design are exposed as well. This tessellation pattern is based off the reflections and rotations of a simple triangle. We can easily explore interesting variations of this design. Note that the lower frame rate for this example is not because of the solver, but instead is largely due to the greater number of objects combined with unoptimized aspects of our implementation. We are reparsing and rerunning the entire program for each frame. In future work, we might only rerun the parts of the program that have changed using ideas such as incremental computation. So far, we've showed several examples where live synchronization allows us to easily modify design parameters. Now we'll discuss how live synchronization enables library writers and users to design custom user interface widgets. We already demonstrated the sliders built into Sketch and Sketch, but if we're not happy with their appearance, we can easily make our own by setting up a shape to uniquely control a single constant in the program. We can use this technique to build special purpose UI widgets. In this example, two sliders attached to a rectangle control the radius of the rounded corner. The sliders grow as the rectangle grows. Shapes we don't want to appear in the final design can be distinguished in the code with a helper annotation and then selectively hidden by our tool. This two-dimensional slider can control two values at once. We could imagine a tool that provides these simple widgets out of the box, but no matter how many controls are built in, the user may want to design custom interfaces. Live synchronization makes this possible. In this example, a 2D slider controls the number of tiles. Sliders control the number of colors and the shape of the repeated elements. The program is written so that these helper dots at the side toggle the visibility of the shape they cover. When the design is complete, we hide the helpers and copy the final SVG code. We looked at some demos of live synchronization interactions. If you'd like to play with the tool yourself, it's available online. We also have some demo videos on YouTube. Just Google for Sketch and Sketch and you'll find everything, including previews of some of our more recent efforts. Speaking of which, because this work is only a first step in combining programmatic and direct manipulation in this particular way, there are a lot of avenues for further research. I want to mention three. The first involves tweaks to the live synchronization approach presented today. There are several knobs to turn in the current implementation. A lot of choices we made were for simplicity in a first implementation, and there's no reason to believe they are optimal. We might experiment by trying different heuristics, different solvers, and maybe even different trace languages. Second, the approach presented today requires the programmer to type up their initial program by hand before the output is available for live synchronization. We're exploring ways to allow the programmer to build up the initial program using direct manipulation. For this domain, that means enabling the user to draw shapes directly on the canvas, as well as directly specify relationships between shapes. These new additions will complement live synchronization. Finally, the motivation we outlined in this talk for combining programmatic and direct manipulation arises in many other areas, such as web development, spreadsheets, presentations, other kinds of document editing, and even non-visual general purpose programming. We'd like to expand beyond vector graphics to bring the benefits of this bi-directional workflow to these other domains. Our goal to provide a live connection between a program and its output is closely related to the goal of many live programming systems. The particular focus of our work is the backwards connection from the output back to the program that generated it. We frame this as a program synthesis problem. The previous program can be thought of as a sketch where all of the constants are holes to be filled. The user's direct manipulation provides a positive example, which constrains how these holes are filled. Our live synchronization is most closely related to a system for PHP by Wang et al. Their approach focused on strings rather than numeric values. When the user directly modified strings in the output, they used execution trace information 
script automatically updates string literals in the code. When an automatic update was not available, they highlighted relevant locations in the program for manual intervention. Although we also use trace information, our system handles numeric expressions instead of strings. And because we don't want to interrupt the direct manipulation workflow, we additionally implemented heuristics to allow automatic synthesis even when there's ambiguity. There are three broader categories of related work, and I'd like to briefly mention. The visual workflow we achieve with live synchronization resembles constraint-oriented programming systems, such as Sketchpad and ThingLab, but in contrast to constraint-oriented programming, our approach starts with a more traditional, deterministic programming model, and we limit the use of constraints solely to the program synthesis phase. Our work also resembles bidirectional programming. In bidirectional programming, some source data is kept in sync with changes to a view of that data by a program, often written in a domain-specific language. In our setting, a program in a general purpose language is kept in sync with changes to its output, not by a user-editable DSL program, but by a fixed framework like Sketch and Sketch, which provides evaluation in one direction and synthesis in the other. Finally, the vision of our work overlaps largely with programming by manipulation systems proposed by Brett Victor and others. These systems tend to start with a direct manipulation interface and then add more and more mechanisms for programming, often in domain-specific or structured programming languages. In contrast, our approach starts with a general purpose language and adds more direct manipulation cap capabilities. We think our approach will be easier to reuse across different application domains, such as the ones mentioned earlier. In summary, with live synchronization, we write a program. It produces output. We directly change the output, which changes our code. Live synchronization is a fast, intuitive, and automatic programming workflow for the visual domains. Thank you for listening.